Metamorphosis by Franz Kafka Translated by David Wiley Part 2 It was not until it was getting dark that evening that Gregor awoke from his deep and coma-like sleep. He would have woken soon afterwards anyway, even if he hadn't been disturbed, as he had had enough sleep and felt fully rested. But he had the impression that some hurried steps and the sound of the door leading into the front room being carefully shut had woken him. The light from the electric street lamps shone palely here and there onto the ceiling and tops of the furniture, but down below, where Gregor was, it was dark. He pushed himself over to the door, feeling his way clumsily with his antennae, of which he was now beginning to learn the value, in order to see what had been happening there. The whole of his left side seemed like one painfully stretched scar, and he limped badly on his two rows of legs. One of the legs had been badly injured in the events of that morning. It was nearly a miracle that only one of them had been, and dragged along lifelessly. It was only when he had reached the door that he realized what it actually was that had drawn him over to it. It was the smell of something to eat. By the door there was a dish filled with sweetened milk with little pieces of white bread floating in it. He was so pleased he almost laughed, and he was even hungrier than he had been that morning, and immediately dipped his head into the milk, nearly covering his eyes with it. But he soon drew his head back again in disappointment. Not only did the pain in his tender left side make it difficult to eat the food, he was only able to eat if his whole body worked together as a snuffling whole, but the milk did not taste at all nice. Milk like this was normally his favorite drink, and his sister had certainly left it there for him because of that. But he turned, almost against his own will, away from the dish and crawled back into the center of the room. Through the crack in the door, Gregor could see that the gas had been lit in the living room. His father at this time would normally be sat with his evening paper, reading it out in a loud voice to Gregor's mother and sometimes to his sister, but there was now not a sound to be heard. Gregor's sister would often write and tell him about this reading, but maybe his father had lost the habit in recent times. It was so quiet all around, too, even though there must have been somebody in the flat. What a quiet life it is, the family lead, said Gregor to himself, and, gazing into the darkness, felt a great pride that he was able to provide a life like that in such a nice home for his sister and parents. But what now? If all this peace and wealth and comfort should come to a horrible and frightening end. That was something that Gregor did not want to think about too much. So he started to move about, crawling up and down the room. Once during that long evening, the door on one side of the room was opened very slightly and hurriedly closed again. Later on, the door on the other side did the same. It seemed that someone needed to enter the room, but thought better of it. Gregor went and waited immediately by the door, resolved either to bring the timorous visitor into the room in some way, or at least to find out who it was. But the door was opened no more that night, and Gregor waited in vain. The previous morning, while the doors were locked, everyone had wanted to get in there to him. But now, now that he had opened up one of the doors and the other had clearly been unlocked sometime during the day, no one came, and the keys were in the other sides. 
It was not until late at night that the gas light in the living room was put out, and now it was easy to see that his parents and sister had stayed awake all that time, as they could all be distinctly heard as they went away together on tiptoe. It was clear that no one would come into Gregor's room anymore until morning. That gave him plenty of time to think undisturbed about how he would have to rearrange his life. For some reason, the tall, empty room where he was forced to remain made him feel uneasy as he lay there flat on the floor, even though he had been living in it for five years. Hardly aware of what he was doing other than a slight feeling of shame, he hurried under the couch. It pressed down on his back a little, and he was no longer able to lift his head, but he nonetheless felt immediately at ease, and his only regret was that his body was too broad to get all underneath. He spent the whole night there. Some of the time he passed in a light sleep, although he frequently woke from it in alarm because of his hunger, and some of the time was spent in worries and vague hopes which, however, always led to the same conclusion. For the time being, he must remain calm. He must show patience and the greatest consideration so that his family could bear the unpleasantness that he, in his present condition, was forced to impose on them. Gregor soon had the opportunity to test the strength of his decisions, as early the next morning, almost before the night had ended, his sister, nearly fully dressed, opened the door from the front room and looked anxiously in. She did not see him straight away, but when she did notice him under the couch, he had to be somewhere for God's sake, he couldn't have flown away. She was so shocked that she lost control of herself and slammed the door shut again from outside. But she seemed to regret her behavior, as she opened the door again straight away and came in on tiptoe as if entering the room of someone seriously ill or even of a stranger. Gregor had pushed his head forward, right to the edge of the couch, and watched her. Would she notice that he had left the milk as it was, realize that it was not from any lack of hunger, and bring him in some other food that was more suitable? If she didn't do it herself, he would rather go hungry than draw her attention to it. Although, he did feel a terrible urge to rush forward from under the couch, throw himself at his sister's feet, and beg her for something good to eat. However, his sister noticed the full dish immediately, and looked at it and the few drops of milk splashed around it with some surprise. She immediately picked it up, using a rag, not her bare hands, and carried it out. Gregor was extremely curious as to what she would bring in its place, imagining the wildest possibilities. But he never could have guessed what his sister, in her goodness, actually did bring. In order to test his taste, she brought him a whole selection of things, all spread out on an old newspaper. There were old, half-rotten vegetables, bones from the evening meal, covered in white sauce that had gone hard, a few raisins and almonds, some cheese that Gregor had declared inedible two days before, a dry roll and some bread spread with butter and salt. As well as all that, she had poured some water into the dish, which had probably been permanently set aside for Gregor's use, and placed it beside them. Then, out of consideration for Gregor's feelings, as she knew that he would not eat in front of her, she hurried out again and even turned the key in the lock so that Gregor would know he could make things as comfortable for himself as he liked. Gregor's little legs whirred, 
At last, he could eat. What's more, his injuries must already have completely healed as he found no difficulty in moving. This amazed him, as more than a month earlier he had cut his finger slightly with a knife. He thought of how his finger had still hurt the day before yesterday. Am I less sensitive than I used to be then? He thought and he was already sucking greedily at the cheese which had immediately, almost compellingly, attracted him much more than the other foods on the newspaper. Quickly, one after another, his eyes watering with pleasure, he consumed the cheese, the vegetables, and the sauce. The fresh foods, on the other hand, he didn't like at all and even dragged the things he did want to eat a little way away from them because he couldn't stand the smell. Long after he had finished eating and lay lethargic in the same place, his sister slowly turned the key in the lock as a sign to him that he should withdraw. He was immediately startled, although he had been half asleep, and he hurried back under the couch. But he needed great self-control to stay there even for the short time that his sister was in the room, as eating so much food had rounded out his body a little, and he could hardly breathe in that narrow space. Half suffocating, he watched with bulging eyes as his sister unselfconsciously took a broom and swept up the leftovers mixing them in with the food he had not even touched at all, as if it could not be used anymore. She quickly dropped it all into a bin, closed it with its wooden lid, and carried everything out. She had hardly turned her back before Gregor came out again from under the couch and stretched himself. This was how Gregor received his food each day now. Once in the morning while his parents and the maid were still asleep, and the second time after everyone had eaten their meal at midday, as his parents would sleep for a little while then as well, and Gregor's sister would send the maid away on some errand. Gregor's father and mother certainly did not want him to starve either, but perhaps it would have been more than they could stand to have any more experience of his feeding than being told about it. And perhaps his sister wanted to spare them what distress she could as they were indeed suffering enough. It was impossible for Gregor to find out what they had told the doctor and the locksmith that first morning to get them out of the flat. As nobody could understand him, nobody, not even his sister, thought that he could understand them. So he had to be content to hear his sister's sighs and appeals to the saints as she moved about his room. It was only later, when she had become a little more used to everything, there was, of course, no question of her ever becoming fully used to the situation, that Gregor would sometimes catch a friendly comment, or at least a comment that could be construed as friendly. He's enjoyed his dinner today. She might say when he had diligently cleared away all the food left for him. Or, if he left most of it, which slowly became more and more frequent, she would often say, sadly, Now everything's just been left there again. Although Gregor wasn't able to hear any news directly, he did listen to much of what was said in the next rooms. And whenever he heard anyone speaking, he would scurry straight to the appropriate door and press his whole body against it. There was seldom any conversation, especially at first, that was not about him in some way, even if only in secret. For two whole days, all the talk at every mealtime was about what they should do now. But even between meals, they spoke about the same subject as there were always at least two members of the family at home. Nobody wanted to be at home by themselves, and it was out of the question to leave the flat entirely empty. 
And on the very first day, the maid had fallen to her knees and begged Gregor's mother to let her go without delay. It was not very clear how much she knew of what had happened, but she left within a quarter of an hour, tearfully thanking Gregor's mother for her dismissal as if she had done her an enormous service. She even swore emphatically not to tell anyone the slightest about what had happened, even though no one had asked that of her. Now, Gregor's sister also had to help his mother with the cooking, although that was not so much bother as no one ate very much. Gregor often heard how one of them would unsuccessfully urge another to eat, and receive no more than, no thanks, I've had enough, or something similar. No one drank very much either. His sister would sometimes ask his father whether he would like a beer, hoping for the chance to go and fetch it herself. When his father then said nothing, she would add, so that he would not feel selfish, that she could send the housekeeper for it. But then his father would close the matter with a big, loud no, and no more would be said. Even before the first day had come to an end, his father had explained to Gregor's mother and sister what their finances and prospects were. Now and then, he stood up from the table and took some receipt or document from the little cash box he had saved from his business when it had collapsed five years earlier. Gregor heard how he opened the complicated lock, and then closed it again after he had taken the item he wanted. What he heard his father say was some of the first good news that Gregor heard since he had first been incarcerated in his room. He had thought that nothing at all remained from his father's business. At least, he had never told him anything different, and Gregor had never asked him about it anyway. Their business misfortune had reduced the family to a state of total despair and Gregor's only concern at that time had been to arrange things so that they could all forget about it as quickly as possible. So then he started working especially hard, with a fiery vigor that raised him from a junior salesman to a traveling representative almost overnight, bringing with it the chance to earn money in quite different ways. Gregor converted his success at work straight into cash that he could lay on the table at home for the benefit of his astonished and delighted family. They had been good times, and they had never come again, at least not with the same splendor, even though Gregor had later earned so much that he was in a position to bear the costs of the whole family, and did bear them. They had even got used to it, both Gregor and the family. They took the money with gratitude, and he was glad to provide it, although there was no longer much warm affection given in return. Gregor only remained close to his sister now. Unlike him, she was very fond of music, and a gifted and expressive violinist. It was his secret plan to send her to the conservatory next year, even though it would cause great expense that would have to be made up for in some other way. During Gregor's short periods in town, conversation with his sister would often turn to the conservatory, but it was only ever mentioned as a lovely dream that could never be realized. Their parents did not like to hear this innocent talk, but Gregor thought about it quite hard and decided he would let them know what he planned with a grand announcement of it on Christmas Day. That was the sort of totally pointless thing that went through his mind in his present state, pressed upright against the door and listening. There were times when he simply became too tired to continue listening, when his head would fall wearily against the door and he would pull it up again with a start, 
as even the slightest noise he caused would be heard next door and they would all go silent. What's he doing now? His father would say after a while, clearly having gone over to the door. And only then would the interrupted conversation slowly be taken up again. When explaining things, his father repeated himself several times. Partly because it was a long time since he had been occupied with these matters himself, and partly because Gregor's mother did not understand everything the first time. From these repeated explanations, Gregor learned, to his pleasure, that despite all their misfortunes, there was still some money available from the old days. It was not a lot, but it had not been touched in the meantime, and some interest had accumulated. Besides that, they had not been using up all the money that Gregor had been bringing home every month keeping only a little for himself, so that that, too, had been accumulating. Behind the door, Gregor nodded with enthusiasm in his pleasure at this unexpected thrift and caution. He could actually have used this surplus money to reduce his father's debt to his boss, and the day when he could have freed himself from that job would have come much closer. But now, it was certainly better the way his father had done things. This money, however, was certainly not enough to enable the family to live off the interest. It was enough to maintain them for, perhaps, one or two years, no more. That's to say, it was money that should not really be touched, but set aside for emergencies. Money to live on had to be earned. His father was healthy but old, and lacking in self-confidence. During the five years that he had not been working, the first holiday in a life that had been full of strain and no success, he had put on a lot of weight and become very slow and clumsy. Would Gregor's elderly mother now have to go and earn money? She suffered from asthma, and it was a strain for her just to move about the home. Every other day would be spent struggling for breath on the sofa by the open window. Would his sister have to go and earn money? She was still a child of 17. Her life up till then had been very enviable, consisting of wearing nice clothes, sleeping late, helping out in the business, joining in with a few modest pleasures, and, most of all, playing the violin. Whenever they began to talk of the need to earn money, Gregor would always first let go of the door and then throw himself onto the cool leather sofa next to it, as he became quite hot with shame and regret. He would often lie there the whole night through, not sleeping a wink, but scratching at the leather for hours on end. Or he might go to all the effort of pushing a chair to the window, climbing up onto the sill and propped up in the chair, leaning on the window to stare out of it. He had used to feel a great sense of freedom doing this, but doing it now was obviously something more remembered than experienced as what he actually saw in this way was becoming less distinct every day, even things that were quite near. He had used to curse the ever-present view of the hospital across the street, but now he could not see it at all. And if he had not known that he lived in Charlottenstrasse, which was a quiet street despite being in the middle of the city, he could have thought he was looking out the window at a barren waste where the gray sky and the gray earth mingled inseparably. His observant sister only needed to notice the chair twice before she would always push it back to its exact position by the window after she had tidied up the room, and even left the inner pane of the window open from then on. 
If Gregor had been able to speak to his sister and thank her for all that she had to do for him, it would have been easier for him to bear it. But as it was, it caused him pain. His sister, naturally, tried as far as possible to pretend there was nothing burdensome about it. And the longer it went on, of course, the better she was able to do so. But as time went by, Gregor was also able to see through it all so much better. It had even become very unpleasant for him now, whenever she entered the room. No sooner had she come in than she would quickly close the door as a precaution so that no one would have to suffer the view into Gregor's room. Then she would go straight to the window and pull it hurriedly open, almost as if she were suffocating. Even if it was cold, she would stay at the window breathing deeply for a little while. She would alarm Gregor twice a day with this running about and noise making. He would stay under the couch, shivering the whole while, knowing full well that she would certainly have liked to spare him this ordeal, but it was impossible for her to be in the same room with him with the windows closed. One day, about a month after Gregor's transformation, when his sister no longer had any particular reason to be shocked at his appearance, she came into the room a little earlier than usual and found him still staring out the window, motionless, and just where he would be most horrible. In itself, his sister's not coming into the room would have been no surprise for Gregor, as it would have been difficult for her to immediately open the window while he was still there. But not only did she not come in, she went straight back and closed the door behind her. A stranger would have thought he had threatened her and tried to bite her. Gregor went straight to hide himself under the couch, of course, but he had to wait until midday before his sister came back, and she seemed much more uneasy than usual. It made him realize that she still found his appearance unbearable, and would continue to do so. She probably even had to overcome the urge to flee when she saw the little bit of him that protruded from under the couch. One day, in order to spare her even this sight, he spent four hours carrying the bedsheet over to the couch on his back and arranged it so that he was completely covered, and his sister would not be able to see him even if she bent down. If she did not think this sheet was necessary, then all she had to do was take it off again, as it was clear enough that it was no pleasure for Gregor to cut himself off so completely. She left the sheet where it was. Gregor even thought he glimpsed a look of gratitude one time when he carefully looked out from under the sheet to see how his sister liked the new arrangement. For the first 14 days, Gregor's parents could not bring themselves to come into the room to see him. He would often hear them say how they appreciated all the new work his sister was doing even though, before, they had seen her as a girl who was somewhat useless and frequently been annoyed with her. But now the two of them, father and mother, would often both wait outside the door of Gregor's room while his sister tidied up in there. And as soon as she went out again, she would have to tell them exactly how everything looked, what Gregor had eaten, how he had behaved this time, and whether, perhaps, any slight improvement could be seen. His mother also wanted to go in and visit Gregor relatively soon, but his father and sister at first persuaded her against it. Gregor listened very closely to all this, and approved fully. Later, though, she had to be held back by force, which made her call out, Let me go and see Gregor! He is my unfortunate son! Can't you understand? I have to see him! And Gregor would think to himself that maybe it would be better if his mother came in, not every day, of course, but one day a week, perhaps. 
She could understand everything much better than his sister, who, for all her courage, was still just a child after all, and really might not have had an adult's appreciation of the burdensome job she had taken on. Gregor's wish to see his mother was soon realized. Out of consideration for his parents, Gregor wanted to avoid being seen at the window during the day. The few square meters of the floor did not give him much room to crawl about. It was hard to just lie quietly through the night. His food soon stopped giving him any pleasure at all, and so, to entertain himself, he got into the habit of crawling up and down the walls and ceiling. He was especially fond of hanging from the ceiling. It was quite different from lying on the floor. He could breathe more freely. His body had a light swing to it. And up there, relaxed and almost happy, it might happen that he would surprise even himself by letting go of the ceiling and landing on the floor with a crash. But now, of course, he had far better control of his body than before, and even with a fall as great as that, caused himself no damage. Very soon, his sister noticed Gregor's new way of entertaining himself. He had, after all, left traces of the adhesive from his feet as he crawled about, and got it into her head to make it as easy as possible for him by removing the furniture that got in his way, especially the chest of drawers and the desk. Now, this was not something that she would be able to do by herself. She did not dare ask for help from her father. The 16-year-old maid had carried on bravely since the cook had left, but she certainly would not have helped in this. She had even asked to be allowed to keep the kitchen locked at all times and never to have to open the door unless it was especially important. So, his sister had no choice but to choose some time when Gregor's father was not there and fetch his mother to help her. As she approached the room, Gregor could hear his mother express her joy, but once at the door, she went silent. First, of course, his sister came in and looked round to see that everything in the room was all right. Only then did she let her mother enter. Gregor had hurriedly pulled the sheet down lower over the couch and put more folds into it so that everything really looked as if it had just been thrown down by chance. Gregor also refrained, this time, from spying out from under the sheet. He gave up the chance to see his mother until later, and was simply glad that she had come in. You can come in. He can't be seen, said his sister, obviously leading her in by the hand. The old chest of drawers was too heavy for a pair of feeble women to be heaving about, but Gregor listened as they pushed it from its place, his sister always taking on the heaviest part of the work for herself and ignoring her mother's warnings that she would strain herself. This lasted a very long time. After laboring at it for 15 minutes or more, his mother said it would be better to leave the chest where it was. For one thing, it was too heavy for them to get the job finished before Gregor's father got home, and leaving it in the middle of the room, it would be in his way even more. And for another thing, it wasn't even sure that taking the furniture away would really be any help to him. She thought just the opposite. The sight of the bare walls saddened her right to her heart. And why wouldn't Gregor feel the same way about it? He'd been used to this furniture in his room for a long time, and it would make him feel abandoned to be in an empty room like that. Then, quietly, almost whispering as if wanting Gregor, whose whereabouts she did not know, to hear not even the tone of her voice, as she was convinced that he did not understand her words, she added, And by taking the furniture away, won't it seem like we're showing that we've given up all hope of improvement? 
and that we're abandoning him to cope for himself, I think it'd be best to leave the room exactly the way it was before, so that when Gregor comes back to us again, he'll find everything unchanged, and he'll be able to forget the time in between all the easier. Hearing those words from his mother made Gregor realize that the lack of any direct human communication, along with the monotonous life led by the family during these two months, must have made him confused. He could think of no other way of explaining to himself why he had seriously wanted his room emptied out. Had he really wanted to transform his room into a cave? A warm room fitted out with the nice furniture he had inherited? That would have let him crawl around unimpeded in any direction, but it would also have let him quickly forget his past when he had still been human. He had come very close to forgetting, and it had only been the voice of his mother, unheard for so long, that had shaken him out of it. Nothing should be removed. Everything had to stay. He could not do without the good influence the furniture had on his condition. And if the furniture made it difficult for him to crawl about mindlessly, that was not a loss, but a great advantage. His sister, unfortunately, did not agree. She had become used to the idea, not without reason, that she was Gregor's spokesman to his parents about the things that concerned him. This meant that his mother's advice now was sufficient reason for her to insist on removing not only the chest of drawers and the desk, as she had thought at first, but all the furniture apart from the all-important couch. It was more than childish perversity, of course, or the unexpected confidence she had recently required that made her insist. She had indeed noticed that Gregor needed a lot of room to crawl about in, whereas the furniture, as far as anyone could see, was of no use to him at all. Girls of that age, though, do become enthusiastic about things and feel they must get their way whenever they can. Perhaps this was what tempted Greta to make Gregor's situation seem even more shocking than it was so that she could do even more for him. Greta would probably be the only one who would dare enter a room dominated by Gregor crawling about the bare walls by himself. So, she refused to let her mother dissuade her. Gregor's mother already looked uneasy in his room. She soon stopped speaking and helped Gregor's sister to get the chest of drawers out with what strength she had. The chest of drawers was something that Gregor could do without if he had to, but the writing desk had to stay. Hardly had the two women pushed the chest of drawers, groaning, out of the room than Gregor poked his head out from under the couch to see what he could do about it. He meant to be as careful and considerate as he could, but unfortunately it was his mother who came back first while Greta in the next room had her arms round the chest pushing and pulling at it from side to side by herself without, of course, moving an inch. His mother was not used to the sight of Gregor. He might have made her ill. So Gregor hurried backwards to the far end of the couch. In his startlement, though, he was not able to prevent the sheet at its front from moving a little. It was enough to attract his mother's attention. She stood very still, remained there a moment, and then went back out to Greta. Gregor kept trying to assure himself that nothing unusual was happening. It was just a few pieces of furniture being moved after all. But he soon had to admit that the women going to and fro, their little calls to each other, the scraping of the furniture on the floor, all these things made him feel as if he were being assailed from all sides. With his head and legs pulled in against him and his body pressed to the floor, 
he was forced to admit to himself that he could not stand all of this much longer. They were emptying his room out, taking away everything that was dear to him. They had already taken out the chest containing his fret saw and other tools. Now they threatened to remove the writing desk with its place clearly worn into the floor. The desk where he had done his homework as a business trainee at high school, even while he had been at infant school. He really could not wait any longer to see whether the two women's intentions were good. He had nearly forgotten they were there anyway, as they were now too tired to say anything while they worked, and he could only hear their feet as they stepped heavily on the floor. So, while the women were leant against the desk in the other room, catching their breath, he sallied out, changed direction four times not knowing what he should say first, before his attention was suddenly caught by the picture on the wall which was already denuded of everything else that had been on it, of the lady dressed in copious fur. He hurried up onto the picture and pressed himself against its glass. It held him firmly and felt good on his hot belly. This picture at least, now totally covered by Gregor, would certainly be taken away by no one. He turned his head to face the door into the living room so that he could watch the women when they came back. They had not allowed themselves a long rest and came back quite soon. Greta had put her arm around her mother and was nearly carrying her. What shall we take now then? said Greta and looked around. Her eyes met those of Gregor on the wall. Perhaps only because her mother was there, she remained calm, bent her face to her so that she would not look round and said, albeit hurriedly and with a tremor in her voice, Come on, let's go back in the living room for a while. Gregor could see what Greta had in mind. She wanted to take her mother somewhere safe, and then chase him down from the wall. Well, she could certainly try it. He sat unyielding on his picture. He would rather jump at Greta's face. But Greta's words had made her mother quite worried. She stepped to one side, saw the enormous brown patch against the flowers of the wallpaper, and before she even realized it was Gregor that she saw, screamed, Oh God! Oh God! Arms outstretched, she fell onto the couch as if she had given up everything and stayed there immobile. Gregor! shouted his sister, glowering at him and shaking her fist. That was the first word she had spoken to him directly since his transformation. She ran into the other room to fetch some kind of smelling salts to bring her mother out of her faint. Gregor wanted to help too. He could save his picture later, although he stuck fast to the glass and had to pull himself off by force. Then he too ran into the next room as if he could advise his sister like in the old days. But he had to just stand behind her doing nothing. She was looking into various bottles. He startled her when she turned round. A bottle fell to the ground and broke. A splinter cut Gregor's face. Some kind of caustic medicine splashed all over him. Now, without delaying any longer, Greta took hold of all the bottles she could and ran with them in to her mother. She slammed the door shut with her foot. So now, Gregor was shut out from his mother who, because of him, might be near death. He could not open the door if he did not want to chase his sister away, and she had to stay with his mother. There was nothing for him to do but wait. And, depressed with anxiety and self-reproach, he began to crawl about. He crawled over everything, 
walls, furniture, ceiling, and finally, in his confusion, as the whole room began to spin around him, he fell down into the middle of the dinner table. He lay there for a while, numb and immobile. All around him it was quiet. Maybe that was a good sign. Then there was someone at the door. The maid, of course, had locked herself in her kitchen so that Greta would have to go and answer it. His father had arrived home. What's happened? were his first words. Greta's appearance must have made everything clear to him. She answered him with subdued voice and openly pressed her face into his chest. Mother's thank you. But she's better now. Gregor got out. Just as I expected, said his father. Just as I always said, but you women wouldn't listen, would you? It was clear to Gregor that Greta had not said enough, and that his father took it to mean that something bad had happened, that he was responsible for some acts of violence. That meant Gregor would now have to try to calm his father, as he did not have the time to explain things to him even if that had been possible. So he fled to the door of his room and pressed himself against it so that his father, when he came in from the hall, could see straight away that Gregor had the best intentions and would go back into his room without delay that it would not be necessary to drive him back, but that they had only to open the door and he would disappear. His father, though, was not in the mood to notice subtleties like that. Ah! He shouted as he came in, sounding as if he were both angry and glad at the same time. Gregor drew his head back from the door and lifted it towards his father. He really had not imagined his father the way he stood there now. Of late, with his new habit of crawling about, he had neglected to pay attention to what was going on in the rest of the flat the way he had done before. He really ought to have expected things to have changed, but still... Was that really his father? The same tired man as used to be laying there entombed in his bed when Gregor came back from his business trip, who would receive him sitting in the armchair in his nightgown when he came back in the evening, who was hardly even able to stand up, but as a sign of his pleasure would just raise his arms and who on the couple of times a year when they went for a walk together on a Sunday or public holiday wrapped up tightly in his overcoat between Gregor and his mother, would always labor his way forward a little more slowly than them, who were already walking slowly for his sake. Who would place his stick down carefully and, if he wanted to say something, would invariably stop and gather his companions around. He was standing up straight enough now, dressed in a smart blue uniform with gold buckles, the sword worn by the employees at the banking institute. Above the high, stiff collar of the coat, his strong double chin emerged. Under the bushy eyebrows, his piercing dark eyes looked out fresh and alert. His normally unkempt white hair was combed down painfully close to his skull. He took his cap, with his gold monogram from probably some bank, and threw it in an arc right across the room onto the sofa. Put his hands in his trouser pockets, pushing back the bottom of his long uniform coat, and, with a look of determination, walked towards Gregor. He probably did not even know himself what he had in mind, but nonetheless lifted his feet unusually high. Gregor was amazed at the enormous size of the soles of his boots, but wasted no time. He knew full well, right from the first day of his new life, 
that his father thought it necessary to always be extremely strict with him. And so he ran up to his father, stopped when his father stopped, scurried forward again when he moved, even slightly. In this way, they went round the room several times without anything decisive happening, without even giving the impression of a chase, as everything went so slowly. Gregor remained all this time on the floor, largely because he feared his father might see it as especially provoking if he fled onto the wall or sewer. Whatever he did, Gregor had to admit that he certainly would not be able to keep up his running about for long. As for each step his father took, he had to carry out countless movements. He became noticeably short of breath. Even in his earlier life, his lungs had not been very reliable. Now, as he lurched about in his efforts to muster all the strength he could for running, he could hardly keep his eyes open. His thoughts became too slow for him to think of any other way of saving himself from running. He almost forgot that the walls were there for him to use, although here they were concealed behind carefully carved furniture full of notches and protrusions. Then, right beside him, lightly tossed. Something flew down and rolled in front of him. It was an apple. Then another one immediately flew at him. Gregor throws in the shot. There was no longer any point in running as his father had decided to bombard him. He had filled his pockets with fruit from the bowl on the sideboard and now, without even taking the time for careful aim, through one apple after another. These little red apples rolled about on the floor, knocking into each other as if they had electric motors. An apple thrown without much force glanced against Gregor's back and slid off without doing any harm. Another one, however, immediately following it, hit squarely and lodged in his back. Gregor wanted to drag himself away, as if he could remove the surprising, the incredible pain by changing his position. But he felt as if nailed to the spot and spread himself out, all his senses in confusion. The last thing he saw was the door of his room being pulled open. His sister was screaming. His mother ran out in front of her in her blouse as his sister had taken off some of her clothes and after she had fainted to make it easier for her to breathe, she ran to his father, her skirts unfastened and sliding one after another to the ground. Stumbling over the skirts, she pushed herself to his father, her arms around him, uniting herself with him totally. Now Gregor lost his ability to see anything. Her hands behind his father's head, begging him to spare her. Gregor's 